truly, I'm so I'm glad that you are with us. Um, I think we've had some remarkable conversations already with people with lived experience, with um, really exciting research and clinical expertise. And I want to take that conversation to the next level. And I'm really excited to have a conversation now with a very good friend and colleague, Colleen Creighton. And Colleen is the executive director of the American Association for Suicidology. Um, and I always say to her, that I love walking into a meeting in Washington and seeing her there on this issue because I know right away that whoever's hosting us has gotten the right person in the room. So please welcome Colleen. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. And, and, and she's right, I do see her all the time. I see her probably at least once a week in it's random true. places. So. You can find us together on Twitter also quite often. Absolutely. Um, so I guess one of the things I want to start with, Colleen, is speaking of seeing each other, um, we saw each other recently at a really amazing, we go to a lot of meetings, as do many of you, I'm sure, but this one really stood out for me, and it was convened by the Brady Campaign to Prevent Gun Violence and the Ad Council uh, around a campaign that they're working on, and Colleen and I were both in the room for that. Um, I think it would be, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't remark uh, today even though you know there is some main stage programming tomorrow on gun violence prevention, but it would be um, a missed opportunity if we didn't talk today about being in the midst of this national conversation yet again on gun violence prevention, that almost two out of every three gun deaths is a suicide death. Uh, and so gun violence prevention is suicide prevention. Um, and so I'd like to first talk to Colleen about that and about your work partnering not only with Brady, but some other groups in this, in this area. And, and I'm really thankful this conversation is starting to take place. Like Heather said, a lot of times the, when we talk about guns or firearms, suicide does not make this conversation. And thanks to folks like Brady, Brady stepped up first and they said, we need to make this connection. Um, Giffords and Moms Demand Action, Every Town, um, Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, all these groups came together and they reached out to my organization and said, we need to have this conversation. How do we do it though? We're the firearms experts. How do we have conversations about suicide? And so I'm, I'm super happy to see this conversation happening, but it's just beginning. Yeah, so I don't know if any of you, uh, about almost exactly a year ago, the Ad Council and Brady put out um, commercials and other kinds of media um, on this hashtag end family fire and the commercial is very powerful and I'm curious if you want to raise your hand if you saw it it was a commercial about safe storage the, the goal is to talk about safe storage of firearms in the home and really understanding that the, their first message really wanted to be to parents um, with children in the home because that was something that everyone who owns a gun could right away maybe find more consensus around and so that first wave of commercials last year was about locking up your guns uh, if they can I always say if your kids can find your Halloween candy or your Christmas presents and they can uh, they can find your guns they always know where they are and so did any of you see that ad a very powerful ad with a little boy and his dad I'm seeing Justin. a couple hands mm -hmm. Justin a couple hands so that was the the first phase of this Brady campaign and Colleen um, and the meeting we're talking about that we just went to uh, and they've been much more deeply involved in this um, but APA is thrilled to be a partner, is the second phase that you will start to see coming out soon. Later, early next year. Early next year. Um, it's, it's nice actually to be in on the front end of a conversation with, um, you know, these are really fancy ad agencies doing this work pro bono through Ad Council. Um, the next phase will be about the role of safe storage in preventing suicide, and that's a much um, trickier cognitive leap to make for a lot of gun owners. They don't ever think that having a gun in their home, in their personal home, has any relation to suicide. They will much more easily understand the risk of a child finding uh, an unattended, unlocked gun. But this is a much more, and it's why it's phase two and not phase one, right? So this is a more difficult message uh, to convey. And so we have a, a suicide and firearms committee that's taking a look at this, because like you said, it's a very nuanced conversation and message that you have to get out there. And he compared it, one of our, our leading researchers said, it's like drunk driving. You said, if you're not gonna give the keys to your friend to get back in the car. So we're not saying, we're not taking a position on guns, yes or no, we're just saying like, if you know someone is in crisis, we have to be able to protect them from certain lethal means. So it's more of a, we're changing the conversation, but we're just letting this conversation take place is the key that we're trying to get forward. Yeah, and I think, you remind me when you mentioned that, that we're really always operating from this public health model 
Um, I think a lot of us in this room, and some of you in the room, may be the reason we know these data, that uh, in terms of deaths by suicide, um, you know, you'll see slightly different numbers, but we tend to think about half of those who die by suicide do not have um, a contemporaneous diagnosis, at least, of mental illness at the time of that death. Um, but that's a, that's a half, so of course, we're not gonna imply that we know the exact reason why half don't, but in those who are in this area talk a lot about, certainly there are people who haven't gotten help and, and might meet those criteria, but also we know that um, people who are suffering from a financial hardship or a relationship breakdown, there's some, you know, some top three sort of life stressors that are also very much um, proximal um, causes or factors involved in deaths by suicide. So we're always trying to reinforce that public health model. And I remember having this conversation on Twitter a few days ago, and I said, you know, when we were talking about sort of in public, the need to know root causes of something, whatever it is, gun violence um, or um, suicide, that we're not ever gonna ignore the need to sort of know why people get to this point, but at the same time, and so what I was saying is, again, like drunk driving, I was saying, you know, putting, clicking your seatbelt doesn't mean that that eliminates <laughs> icy roads and other drivers being awful, but it does mean that if you're in a crash, you're much more likely to live. And so with all the lethal means safety that a lot of our organizations do together, it's the same thing. Um, safely storing your gun or sensible gun laws do not mean that we are eliminating rage of other people or despair among you, but it does mean that you're more likely to survive rage and despair. So I think, just so you all know, we're very much talking within that public health model wherever we go and especially on the Hill. Absolutely. You wanna talk about your work on the Hill? Yeah, so like Heather said, I see her often on the Hill. Um, one of the things coming into my organization I realized is that we were often left out of the conversation. Um, so it's kind of like I'm Where's Waldo at times. I appear everywhere and just in different You are segments. everywhere, I love it. But on the Hill, we just signed on to um, the ERPO HR 1236. But because suicide affects every single demographic out there, I'm up on the hill looking at every bill, whether it's on veterans affairs, whether it's you know, farmers and issues that are happening with uh, the agricultural community, whether it's with youth, we're seeing a lot more, whether it's the Congressional Black Caucus and all the stuff they've been doing. Um, I'm just staying attention because the conversation's taking place. What I'm trying to do for my role is get one, those different segments of the population talking to one another. Um, so I'm always on the hill just following legislation uh, and just going up to congressional offices, briefing their staff and say, you're having this conversation, do you know the facts about suicide? Do you know what's happening in your own uh, district, in your own congressional district? Um, and getting their voices out there. And so we do have, we have a number um, of Congress women and men who have lost someone they love to suicide. And I'm trying to get them to tell their story if they're very afraid to. We only have one that's really coming out with their story. Um, even like the Sergeant of Arms coming out and telling their story. So, my message back to them is like, if you're not talking about it, you're not really encouraging your constituents to talk about it. So we kind of have to have this top down and bottom up approach at the same time. One of the things that I think you and I and, and my colleagues on APA's advocacy team really run into a lot, um, and it's a lovely problem to have, frankly, is especially when I go up to talk about military and veterans, mental health and suicide prevention issues, uh, we hear a lot about how partisan or divided Congress can be these days. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years, it's always like that. But um, on, on the issue on which I work for you all, for APA, when I walk in the door, there, that, that doesn't exist. I mean, there's not a staffer or a member of Congress who doesn't want to welcome our expertise on that, who doesn't, you know, I get called far more often on this than I did when I was covering, uh, unfortunately, than when I was covering NSF basic research. So the, the interest and the will are there. I think one of the things we run into a lot, and it, takes being sort of charming um, and relentless at the same time is there are a lot of people who have good intentions around suicide prevention legislation um, and we take a sort of a deep gasp when we see what that legislation actually looks like because there are um, things that may be well intended that A might not work, B might actually be harmful. So mm -hmm. I have an example, but do you have examples like that? So we spent a lot of time trying to tell people like, it's great that you wanna write that bill. Can I actually get you to write this bill over here instead? So we, we behind the scenes are trying to stop a lot of legislation as much as we're trying to promote other legislation. And there was, there was a, a bill that they were planning for police officers, because I don't know if you've seen the news, but the first responders are experiencing a high number of suicides within their ranks. I think um, NYPD just lost a fourth uh, in like a series of two weeks. And so they were drafting this based on some um, 
some legislation they thought would be a good idea on how police departments can do a training after there's been a death. And what they found out, we brought up our experts and Mike sat them down and said, this is what happened. Here's the repercussions that happened with the Marine Corps when they tried that. And here's why it didn't work. And there's a huge detrimental impact on the back end. So you're going to want to be careful with this. And so then they didn't. They actually pulled the legislation. Good. But it does, it, again, it takes a multi-pronged approach of like, that's a great idea. We need energy. But we have to also know what's been done um, previous to that, too. Right. And to be able to translate that research in ways that are not only immediately understandable for a policymaker audience, most of whom do not come out of scientific backgrounds. You know, most people on the Hill, members and their staff, tend to have been, not surprisingly, government majors or poli-sci. Um, so to translate science, um, even on, and especially on an issue this compelling, um, is really, I find it the exciting part of the job, obviously, but it's, mm -hmm. it's an issue. There is um, the, the example I was thinking of um, was with something called an oath of exit, and I don't know if any of you heard about that. There, and this was about a year or two ago, there was um, a new member of Congress who's a veteran himself, and he came in raring to go, which we love, um, and wanting to do some legislation about veterans' mental health, and he proposed um, a bill that had this language on oath of exit. Have any of you heard of this? either in the veteran community, military community, some of you, or in other areas. I see my VA psychologists raising their hands. Um, my VA psychologists. Uh, this was, again, well-intentioned. This was a veteran himself who said, you know what, there's such a warrior ethos that um, if we can get everyone, while they're still on active duty or reserve or guard components, um, before they become veterans, to say, to make, take literally an oath saying, I will not die by suicide. Um, I will not do that. Um, then I think that would you know, have an effect. And Thankfully, it wasn't just me. It was the then um, psychologist who was head of VA's Suicide Prevention Office. Um, it was Craig Bryan, another wonderful psychologist researcher in this area who does work on military and veteran suicide. All three of us got called by the same reporter the same day, and thankfully, independently, all said the same thing, which was, oh, wow, please no. Um, that actually has potentially really fatal unintended effects because that, to us, that means, and there's some research to back it up, that those veterans are actually just more unlikely to seek help then. It does, it's not, taking an oath isn't gonna make you not ever distressed. It's gonna maybe make you less likely to ask for help when you are. And so um, it's one thing talking to a reporter about that. It's another thing to, I had to call the staffer and this um, new member of Congress's office and say, hey there, and he said, I'm assuming you're 100% behind our bill. And I was like, yeah, not so much. Um, but can I come up and talk to you about it? And can we, shift where that goes. I thought it worked. It came back in legislation this year. So we're going to have that conversation all over again. Okay. Um, coming back out of that, let's go back up to your level of, you know, head of an organization, one of the premier organizations, obviously, in this area that pulls not just from psychologists, but everyone working in this area. Um, tell me from that seat where you are, what you, what you like about what you see, what you, if there are things you don't like, what you want us all to be doing more of, better of. And, and so coming into the field, one of the things that's frustrating to me um, is that no one communicates with one another. So my organization is a membership base, but it represents clinicians, crisis centers, loss survivors, attempt survivors, researchers, um, prevention experts, public health officials, law enforcement, veterans. And everybody has the approach that meets their specific population. Um, and one of the things that's frustrating is like there's so much good work being done on the ground, but there's no way to amplify that. And so what I'm trying to do um, in, in my role is to really amplify the great work that's happening across the ground. Perfect example, so anyone from Montana here, um, I spent some time this past year out in Arlie, Montana, which it, has anyone seen the warrior movement at, that these kids have done? So a couple of hands. It's this group of kids out on a reservation in Arlie, Montana, and what they realized is that they had lost a number of friends and loved ones to suicide. They said, we want to do something. We don't know what to do. Um, and then you try to Google, like, hey, I want to look at what's happening, and it's very frustrating because mm. it's hard to find, right? They couldn't find an approach that met them um, specifically. So what they did is they started this warrior movement, they call it. And it's about how you'd be a leader in your community by talking about the issue, by not being afraid to stand up if you need help, by, by helping a friend, by being there for a friend. Um, and then they ended up winning the state championship. But they did these like videos, like selfie videos, and they started going viral. Um, and because when, when I was meeting on the Hill, perfect example, I was meeting with Tester about some veteran legislation. And I literally chased him down the hall and grabbed him. I said, but I have one more question about you kids in your district in Arlie. Can we talk? 
And we ended up with him in his office giving an award to the RLE on the ground. Um, but I, what I'd like to do is there's a lot of stories like that happening in communities across the country. If you know of any too, let me know. We're going to try to bring them up so that others know that stuff is being done in their own community and how they can help. And here's where you plug your 2020 meeting for all of us to attend if we don't already know about it. How many of you are also AAS members or have gone to an AAS convention? A few hands, yay. Okay, this means it's ripe for growth, right? So where are you and when next? Uh, we are in Portland, uh, Oregon in April in 2020 next year. So definitely come join us. Um, we're working a lot with um, Lines for Life out there. The Crisis Center is doing a lot with us. We're gonna bring in youth. Uh, if you don't know, our current president, uh, Dr. Jonathan Singer, his, one of his big priorities and research areas is on youth and suicide. We have a brand new youth center for the prevention of youth suicide that's launching too, where we have an advisory panel of kids and teens. Um, we have great kids like Fenway Jones, who's doing this thing with uh, Dungeons and Dragons. So mm -hmm. I had to get schooled in Dungeons and Dragons and learn how to play. Um, and so, but she's in doing r money for local crisis centers. So she'll do a game in a community and then raise money and that money goes locally. Um, so I, you know, if, if there's any, in your schools or districts too, if there's any way, if I hear of something happening in the ground that we can help your community too, let me know. That also makes me think when we're talking about impact and letting people know, you and I, and people tease us sometimes about this, but we're very active on Twitter. And, and my excuse is that um, uh, I work in the military and veterans community and they are on Twitter all the time. I live, live tweet hearings. Um, reports come out and we analyze them in real time. So this is how they like to operate and both get their news, but also sort of engage back. Um, I've had three or four, and I'm a clinical psychologist, but obviously not practicing these days, but I've gotten four DMs um, from veterans about, you know, how can I get into care? And so have made those happen. Um, but even just sort of the, um, the tweeting that you and I do about our organizational work um, what do you say to a room full of people? How many of you are active tweeters, by the way? Okay, a few more hands. Nice. Um, They're like, that was yesterday. We've moved on to new, fancier things. Yeah, like is everyone, all the cool kids have left Twitter already? Are you somewhere else um, we should be? But what do you tell a, a group of psychologists, um, you know, scientists, clinicians, all of the above, professors, about the impact that they can have um, through social media? Uh, absolutely. So what we've been able to do is, so one of the things we struggle with in my association too is that there's a ton of great research on this topic out there, but it lives in that bubble and it lives in that silo. And so we're struggling, and I know you mentioned it earlier, is really m getting that message out and kind of using that communication piece. And so even at the conference, here's all the posters, like, you know, taking, um, w working with the students in the posters and saying, how do we bring what's happening at the poster session out into the public? And Twitter and social media is a way to do that. Um, and then you can get that fostering that communication back and forth. And so I've, I've done a couple of, I've seen a couple of questions come through. You know what, I'm gonna connect you directly to that researcher who's doing that. They can answer your question um, more adequately. So, so I think it's a, it's a, think of it not as just pushing information out, but think of it as a two-way dialogue that you can start and engage more folks. And I will say, um, your members of Congress are on Twitter and, um, Often their staff are the ones who are handling those accounts, but not always. I remember I tweeted something about veterans something and a, a pretty conservative uh, congressman, his account tweeted back at me and said, Heather, I'd like you to come up and talk to us about those VA infrastructure research needs. And I'm, you know, obviously I'm gonna respond to that and say, sure, I'll be up, you know, how soon is too soon. But um, he DM'd me and said, by the way, that's me, the congressman writing to you, not my staff. Seriously, how, when can you come in? And I was like, I'm putting on my flats. I'm coming up right now. Um, so they do pay attention, especially if there's something you want to let your member know, tag him or her in that tweet. They really do read that. That's like, it's the newer version of what they all used to do, which is re and still do, which is read their hometown newspaper every morning. Someone's responsible for that. And then pushing that up the chain to other people in the office to let them know like what kind of traffic they're getting. Um, and they care more and more about it. So um, please always think of that as an option. Um, we're almost out of time. And so she and I, obviously, Colleen and I could talk about this for, forever, but we'll have time back in Washington to talk to each other. What is your message to everyone here as they, um, we have one more really exciting speaker for you all, but then as you head back out into the rest of convention, 
back into your real lives. What is your message? What's your call to action, your benediction for them going out? That you have a role. Because I think a lot of times what you hear is like, I'm going to leave that to the experts. The experts know what to do. Um, but I think everybody in this room either knows somebody or knows of somebody who knows of somebody that's been impacted by suicide. And I think what you can do is definitely start the conversation, um, but figure out a role that you can play, whether it's your community, your school, your, your professional organization, um, APA, and, and let's get this conversation um, so that more people are addressing it and we can get more people the help that they need. Thank you. Everyone, please thank Colleen for coming out with us. Thank, thank you. you. This was fun.